Hey, Scott Archer Jones is currently working on his sixth novel in New Mexico. After stints in the Netherlands, Scotland, Norway, and less exotic locations. That does not include Angel Fire, I'm sure. He's worked for a power company, grocers, a lumberyard, and an energy company. I think it's important for those who attend reader sessions to understand and to know a little bit about the reader. Scott touches on firewood. He is at least a mile from his nearest neighbor. He is, most importantly, to the readers group, the treasurer of the Shooter Library of Angel Fire, the treasurer, and so you can imagine what occupies most of his thoughts as Somos is involved in the capital campaign. He's published three novels, Ju Jupiter and Gilgamesh, a novel of Sumeria and Texas, The Big Wheel, and A Rising Tide of People Swept Away. And I just want to say a little bit about Jupiter and Gilgamesh. It took first finalist in two categories in the Eric Hoffer Award, Legacy Fiction and First Horizon, the U.S. Review gives us a flash review as our, as our big moment, and here it is, the first runner-up. It's about a Texas businessman come hermit and a 5,000-year-old Sumerian king who form a mutually beneficial relationship and establish a mutually benefit, beneficial conversation with each other, and then it just kind of flows from there. <laughs> Scott's due to release his fourth novel anticipated for January 19th. It's a real pleasure and Scott's one of our regulars to introduce Scott Archer Jones. So this is Rising Tide. It's got a great cover, which I didn't have anything to do with, so that's why we talk it up. And I'm going to do a couple of pages out of it that uh, everybody likes. As a matter of fact, they say, why isn't the rest of the book like this? <laughs> <laughs> There's a, a woman named Eileen McKinnon, and uh, she's deeply religious, and she works in a bookstore called Keys to the, he uh, to the Kingdom. Uh, which is actually a religious bookstore. They're fascinating. You should go into them sometimes. The dioramas are great. So Eileen McKinnett dropped into a recliner and heard it complain under her weight. She waited for a stillness to return to the room, to the chair, to her hands. Time didn't count in that living room. The air was thick and somnolent. The room was hot, just the way she liked it. Hot enough that she sweated in penance. In the kitchen, the preacher echoed forth from the radio, his phrasing taut, compelling, and as rhythmic as a hymn. He preached on King Ahab and Ahab's chariot of redemption. Here in the front room, though, on the doily-strewn couch, the devil reclined, wizened and smelling like pine tar. I knew Ahab. Good man overall, damn him, the devil said, but I really knew his wife, Jezebel. I bet you knew her, she said. Jessie gave in to me as easy as kiss my hand. Woman loved luxury, she did. We don't all give in. You will. The devil laughed, and his breath had that smell of sap backed up by a dark, smoky tank. You'll give in because you want it too much, don't you? Wanting is the thing, isn't it? If you can get me to need something, soon I need everything. And what do you lust after, my dearest? Is it the food, pie, butter dripping off a fresh baked biscuit, tender, juicy pig perched on your fork, kissing your lips with tiny squeals? Her mouth made the tiniest smack. She swallowed. No thanks. Food is but a fuel that fires God's engines. Yeah, there's some truth to that, at least for you. You want food, but you need something more. That chocolate cake is just a layer of dream on top of real desire. Uh, a consolation for the truer loss. Hmm, what is it you need? You want, want the man, don't you? Ah, the other, the beloved, 
the two-backed beast, that intimacy, that oneness with another being, that entanglement of spirit and flesh. You're a dirty, dirty thing, aren't you? <laughs> Disgusting. You made me, I mean. I am but your creation. God made you and threw you into the pit. True enough as far as it goes, but enough about me. I can give you what you need, you know, all 120 pounds of him, all those wrinkles and sagging skin, all that black Magyar hair, all of cheesy Milosevic Brzezinski. And then he folded his hands and crossed his hooves. Then what? You become of the world, my world. I shall surrender up this corporeal world unto the demands of my Savior, Jesus Christ. Those words are so preacher-like. That's how I know you'll give in, because they're just something you parrot. He laughed with a sawing sound. Ha, ha, ha. She shook her head. No, he would not have her, at least not today. She sighed and reached up to touch the ring of sweat beneath her arm. Even facing the devil, she still had to take care of ordinary life. Time to get to work at the key to the kingdom. She shifted, about to stand, and a fart escaped. The devil cackled. There's your corporeal world, all right. Okay. This next one actually um, is an idea that I kind of forgot about for 35 years, I think. Uh, I got it from a newspaper clipping um, in Houston, and it's about Galveston. And it's called, Arcadia Swept Down. Until today, I took care of my younger brother, Donnie. Each, mother, each morning, Donnie would ask, Elizabeth, what shall we do today? For 60 years, I gave the same answer. Donald, we'll have breakfast, then we'll tend to the past. Great grandfather called the house Arcadia. Cotton shipping built it on an elegant Galveston esplanade. Flat roofed. How I hated that roof. Its amalgamation of tin and copper, solder and hot tar patch, leak in, cold in, bats in. I lived within one of the beautiful bedrooms that opened not only onto the landing that circled the stairs, but that had double doors onto a balcony that overlooked the ballroom floor. After my first fall, we moved the furniture downstairs to the Jubilee Parlor, a room that, Frank, uh, that flanked the front uh, door. Donnie and I emptied out the furniture, the books and boxes of family photos, my Bernard degree. We disassembled the break fronts. He would tug on the area rug we placed under each piece of furniture and I would shove into the ballroom depths, into narrow rows of the past. Twin beds in the Jubilee, where we could keep tabs on our infirmities, his dementia, my heart and eyesight. On top of Arcadia rested a beautiful yellow cornice in the widow's walk. The brick facing had been reinforced during the Civil War with Star of Texas cast iron plates painted black. A portico wide enough to hold two carriages side by side. All of those lead lights allowed the sunshine to stream in across the wide pine planks. During the 2008 hurricane, we brought the dead lights out of the carriage house and covered all the glass. Just too much, installing the old pine battens to protect the glass, we never took them down. Mr. Childepa painted them white as he painted Arcadia for two weeks each year. He'd been dead for 10 years. All slipped away, first the gardener, then the cook and maid, then Childepeth and the nurse. Donnie loved his newspaper, delivered every morning and read through word by word over breakfast. Our time of beignets had come and gone, and for the last couple of decades we cooked grits and boiled eggs, and coffee, like mud as I preferred. After a while, the paper could have been the same sheaf of newsprint, that identical set of headlines would have been new and novel to him every day. The kitchen, full of rotted lead pipes, old gas jets, cabinets that sagged away from the wall, became the hole that led to the back door. Donnie bundled up his papers and stacked the bales, left a walkway through the room. The paper's weight must have provoked the further collapse of piers and beams under the house, 
so that the floor swam away from us down into the ground. Just enough money. All bills went down in town to be paid by the accountant at Great Grandfather's company, and each year the report arrived at Christmas. But the house itself, demands for love, for repair, for devotion, our lives slid away from us, caught up in the house and its needs. Every room held its stacks of trunks and old hat boxes, the cases and valises stuffed with family, <coughs> the toys and thrills, the hot summer afternoons, the bicycles and dolls of our childhood, and of our parents, and of our grandparents. When the carriage house in the rear began to crumble, I asked Donnie to bring all of its treasures into the house. We let the garage claim the four old cars there, and my Buick, and Donnie's convertible Lincoln. They huddled under the collapse, kept just as the family would have wanted. We used taxis for food and doctor, um, called one for each week for the six-mile journey to the grocery store. Each year a new driver to learn, who had to wait for us while we shopped. Donnie called each one Joseph, even the young woman. We lived with cobwebs and pizza boxes, harder now to carry anything out to the curb for the trash mill. They never changed decade after decade, but we did. We lived on packaged food nestled into the refrigerator. Cheese balls, donuts, chicken noodle soup, pot pies. What that dining room had witnessed. Christmas dinners for 20 that had lasted hours, under candlelight with the silver its own night sky under the burning wicks. The plates gleaming as they were filled, worshipped, removed for the next course. Fifty years later, I ate my microwave popcorn in counterpoint to the grandeur, and Donnie munched cool ranch Doritos and beamed it. <laughs> the old chandelier shuddered to see what we had become, or maybe it was the trucks trailing by on the Esplanade. Donnie stacked the food boxes in the ballroom, their own archive. Tonight I wait. I lie in the kitchen. I sent Donnie for help, sent him out the door. In my near blindness, I crashed my walker into a wall of newspaper. It swept down to pin me under its ephemeral news. I've been here for a while, two days, I think. I believe sooner or later someone will discover my foggy brother on the street and trace him back to Arcadia. It hardly matters. Arcadia's future is short. Um, you know surveys in the magazines? Uh, how many of you have the courage to admit that you actually take those surveys? <laughs> you know, like Cosmos, uh, where uh, it's, are you sexy enough to keep your man? <laughs> Outdoor magazine, are you really an athlete or a geek? You know? Or, uh, let's see, uh, NRA? Um, how well do you know your guns? Well, I've got a survey for you. I call it the Rorschach survey. Sure, you two have hit it off and match needs and desires pretty much. You scribble down the list of the offsets, the rough and compliments that were smooth, the passive that correlates with the pugnacious. You two remember, uh, resemble a folded ink block, but will it last? Both of you should delve deeper, and we have just the guide. Explore together, choose the answer that most suits your personality, and watch his or her psyche unfold. Now, you can take this if you want. <laughs> My idea of nature is, one, watching Blue Planet 2 on TV. Two, weeding the front flower beds. Three, biking on the boardwalk. Four, hiking up to a scenic lake. Five, sleeping in an eight ounce hammock suspended off of Devil's Tower. My idea of a job well done is, one, putting away the folded laundry. Two, supporting public TV by buying Dr. Blake's DVDs. Three, finishing a law, school, a, a law degree started in prison. Four, raising five children. Five, planning and executing the perfect murder. <laughs> Conspiracy theories turn out to be, one, either wrong, fantasies, lies, or bad science. Two, sometimes true about politics. Three, 
mostly true if about capitalism and corporations. Four, always true if about the CIA and the FBI. Five, all about covering up the real conspiracies. <laughs> Crimes I find acceptable are, one, jaywalking. Two, driving five miles an hour over the speed limit. Three, cheating on my taxes. Four, cheating on my partner. Five, committing genocide in the Middle East or Africa. <laughs> The person I love lives, one, in a one-bedroom efficiency, two, in a single-wide trailer, three, in the Hamptons, four, in my gatehouse, hovered out over the edge of the downs, five, in the iron bowels of the earth, watched over by the Sumerian gods of death. <laughs> the greatest technical mystery to me in the world is, one, the thermos bottle, Two, my iPad. Three, DNA's role in shaping all animate life. Four, life's duality is both a wave and a particle. Five, the 18 hidden dimensions of the Illuminati. <laughs> I would rather possess, one, a good reputation. Two, a house that is perfect for me. Three, a million dollars. Four, immortality. Five, insidious control over the minds of a million people. <laughs> I prefer the following foods the most. One, simple hamburger and fries. Two, traditional foods like Thanksgiving turkey. Three, ethnically diverse food with strange and challenging spices. Four, live four ounce grub worms. Five, the snake that eats its own tail. I know that I am, one, male, two, female, Three, gen, non-gender conforming. Four, changeable. Or five, a new form of being as yet undocumented. <laughs> the truth is, one, all of the above. Two, none of the above. Three, all points in between. <laughs>